In 1973, the legendary head of National Semiconductor, Charlie Spork, RIP, told analysts in Los Angeles that the Japanese were, quote, coming down the pike, end quote. He was not wrong. In the nine years from 1975 to 1984, Japan doubled their share of the integrated circuit industry from 19% to 38%. Famously, by 1986, just three of the 11 American DRAM memory makers were left still in business. But more than just numbers, Japan's rise struck fear in the very heart of American capitalism. It led the country to deeply reflect on how they conducted their own way of business. Looking back at it now, the hysteria is hard to believe. Were the Japanese really that good at semiconductors? No, but I can see why people thought so. In this video, we explore the question, why was Japan so quote quote good at semiconductors? I think the best place to start would be with business structures. Japan's memory making dominance and the focus of American semiconductor concern was centered on six companies, NEC, Fujitsu, Hitachi, Toshiba, Mitsubishi Electric, and Oki Electric. Each of these six companies was part of a larger business family. A lot of the output was bought by an affiliated electronics company, and at least in the early days of the 1970s, they even bought their semiconductor manufacturing equipment from affiliates. This vertical integration benefited both sides of the deal. The electronics company knew what chip components were coming and can design accordingly, and for the semiconductor makers, the family represented a critical demand source to fund volume and enforce quality. Volume was significant. In the early 1970s, half the world's integrated circuits went into calculators. But let me talk about quality. In the American semiconductor industry's early days, the U.S. military bought and set key standards including in product quality. For the Japanese, product quality was provided not by the military, but collaborations in the 1960s and 1970s between Japan's telecom monopoly NTT and three of its family firms, Fujitsu, Hitachi, and NEC. Since they were developing NEC's telecommunications equipment, it was a prized job. NTT's electrical communication laboratory, a well-respected semiconductor R&D lab, applied a thorough quality check process to assure the chip's reliability. This forced Fujitsu, Hitachi, and NEC to produce better semiconductors, and whatever they learned to do, NTT circulated amongst the industry, lifting up the other three chip companies. The American semiconductor industry in the late 1970s and early 1980s, on the other hand, was a mix of one very big but closed manufacturer as well as a bunch of smaller specialty manufacturers. That massive manufacturer was IBM, and they were a formidable player. At their peak, they produced up to 20 million chips a day. But starting with the System 360 mainframe computer lineup in 1964, IBM only produced chips for their own consumption. None were sold to external customers. So the rest of the American semiconductor industry was mostly made up of smaller firms producing special chips for smaller customers. This characterization was a sensitive one. In 1981, American and Japanese semiconductor makers held their first face-to-face -face meeting in Palo Alto to discuss trade issues. During the meeting, an executive made the mistake of calling American firms boutique. This triggered a shouting match between the legendary Bob Noyce and an NEC executive over unfair Japanese government subsidies. Nevertheless, the characterization seems accurate to me. The smaller American merchant firms competed in two ways, either producing a lot of low-cost, high-volume product like semiconductor memories, think DRAM, or designing a more complex, differentiated semiconductor product, think something like an analog thingy, or an EEPROM, or a microprocessor. The merchant semiconductor companies that produced a high-volume, low-margin product naturally suffered lower than average profit margins. With fewer profits to reinvest and lacking financial support from any quote-unquote siblings, these producers could not build up a cash cushion to protect themselves from serious downturns or invest in their next factory. And American buyers of commodity memory, guys like Sun and Compaq, who themselves faced fierce competition, had little interest in paying higher prices for what they felt was an inferior product just for the sake of patriotism. This left the high-volume, low-profit American merchants vulnerable to Japanese competition in exactly what the Japanese were good at for a long time, scale and manufacturing efficiencies. This time period came as semiconductor factories got increasingly more expensive. 
In 1974, American semiconductor makers spent about 6% of their revenue on building a leading-edge fab. In 1984, just 10 years later, Americans were spending 20% of their revenues on new fab construction, a situation that immensely strained their financial positions. The Japanese suffered the same expansion, but more so. From 1974 to 1984, the same time period, they went from spending 6% to a staggering 28% of revenues on new fab construction. In 1984, Japan spent 900 billion yen on semiconductor fabrication alone. That year, the country was investing more money into semiconductors than they did even steel. Steel! The Japanese companies being somehow able to fund and scale their stupefyingly expensive factories was key to Japan's famed semiconductor quality and cost advantages. This money also let the Japanese to invest in the latest automation, process, and device technologies to further cut costs and improve quality. Higher volumes led to better learning curves and then to lower product costs. In the 1970s, for every doubling of production, you get almost a 30% improvement in per unit costs. For example, after chips are diced out of the wafer, they have to be packaged. Part of that involves bonding the tiny connections from the chip to the package. This was previously done by cheap human hands, often located overseas in Hong Kong, Singapore, or Taiwan. But in 1973, NEC produced an automated computer-controlled lead bonding process for their 16K DRAM, eliminating the need for human involvement. Americans somewhat knew about this, and even knew that it contributed to their cost disadvantages against the Japanese, but they did not implement it, either because of their existing overseas operations or cost. The American government could have helped here. The Japanese government via MIDI encouraged this type of automation with a 13% tax credit for the purchase of computer-controlled robots and other automated assembly line equipment that lasted until 1983. Another area in which the Japanese made major progress against the Americans was in cleanliness. One NEC fab worker recalls teams of female engineers scouring the factory for dust sources as part of a zero-defect mindset. This focus on cleanliness, again, can be traced to the influence of NTT's ECL. And as it turned out, this cleanliness was a huge contributor to lower yields. The Japanese semiconductor makers pioneered core clean room concepts like mini environments that involve splitting the clean room into subsections of varying cleanliness. This saves us from the expensive task of making the whole room super clean. Just do it for one small mini environment. So where did the money come from? There was no single capital source, so let me point out some of the major culprits. First and foremost, these guys took out a lot of debt. Between 1966 and 1980, Japanese top five semiconductor companies carried debt amounts of up to 3.25 times their equity. I should note that after 1980, those debt ratios came down. This was apparently due to rising overseas export revenues and the prolific issuance of convertible bonds. But even so, debt equity ratios as late as 1983 remained quite high, between 60 to 130 percent. American semiconductor merchant firms, meaning those not owned by bigger companies like IBM or Western Electric, carried debt on average of just half their equity amounts, so a debt equity ratio of 50 percent. And that makes sense. Even post-1980, the U.S. ratios are more realistic. After all, what kind of a crazy person at a bank will lend so much debt to a super capital-intensive manufacturer selling a high-volume commodity that you have to upgrade every two years. Japanese banks were willing to lend for these expensive, risky fabs, in part because the lending environment was quite plentiful back then and because of the family connection. Prior to 1979, Japanese companies profited from higher DRAM prices sold to the Japanese domestic markets, which had little competition since it was closed off to foreigners. But even before 1979, that was never capable of funding the newest nodes, so the six depended on exports, mostly to the US, and you can see why that's a problem. Japan's semiconductor rise sparked a great deal of cultural quote-unquote analysis, with various observers traveling there to review how they translated into better performance. When producing DRAM, other semiconductor products too, but DRAM especially, all the companies are using the same basic recipe. However, each company makes their own tweak to the recipe to create a variant that they believe will grant them the most success. Think of an apple pie. Many different bakeries bake apple pies. The core concept is the same. 
The key differentiator between shops are the spices, cook time, ingredients, and the extra preparation we just generally call love that go into making said pie. Japanese semiconductor employees worked long hours and stayed years at their jobs, called culture or whatever you want, but it let new workers gain tacit knowledge vital to excel at their task. And in general, Japanese managers in the 1970s and 1980s had more confidence in their operators than American managers did. Critically, these proficiency gains came essentially free. Japanese electrical machinery workers got more productive from 1975 to 1985 as measured by an index, from 18.2 to 67.7, growing some 3.7 times improvement. Yet, their wages did not keep up with that, growing just 19.5% over the same time period. In other words, Japanese workers got better at what they were doing over time, yet they were not paid their worth, perhaps in part due to culture or the lifetime employment system, and Japanese companies were able to invest the surplus into more capacity. The American media and government made a big study of Japan's MIDI and their quote-unquote collaborative industrial policy. In particular, much attention was paid to Japan's 1976 VLSI project as a masterful coordination of public-private resources to leapfrog American chips. It directly inspired the formation of Semitech later in the decade. Now, with the benefit of hindsight and several videos on the topic, it seems pretty clear to me that the cooperative part of the project had little to do, at best, with Japan's semiconductor excellence. Even the director of the cooperative lab, Yasuo Tarui, pointed out that less than 20% of the project's total budget was spent on its cooperative lab. The rest of the budget was simply dispersed to the individual Japanese R&D labs for individual work. The 1976 VLSI project was notable for being the first to do this type of cooperation, but cooperation between competing companies was hard to achieve, a situation Semitech itself later experienced. And the work done by the lab itself focused on several next-generation orthography processes like proximity x-ray and e-beam. The latter is used for making masks, but neither is good for high-volume production. So while the project got much attention in the foreign media at the time as this nefarious government project, I find it difficult to attribute Japan's semiconductor dominance to the project, specifically. To me, the government money mattered far more than the cooperation. The end of the Japanese semiconductor dominance era saw the reversal of everything that contributed to its rise. First, the 1986 Japan-US Semiconductor Trade Agreement. It cut Japanese market access to the profitable United States market while leaving it open for other overseas producers like South Korea, namely Samsung, and Taiwan, as well as Micron, the last American DRAM maker. Cutting off Japan's export volumes raises their chip's fundamental cost of production, essentially the price learning curve in reverse. The fabs can't get profitable without export sales overseas. Second, the 1985 Plaza Accord, which rapidly revalued the Japanese yen from 240 yen per dollar to 120. This compounded existing production cost disadvantages and made Japanese memory products yet less competitive compared to those made in South Korea or Taiwan. Third, the fall of the Soviet Union and globalization trends in Asia let Western companies harness cheap labor abroad in areas like India and the People's Republic of China. This enabled, first, the rise of commodity PC boxes powered by Intel CPUs and Microsoft software. These cheap commodity PC boxes demanded cheap commodity DRAM modules. This turned away from Japan's perceived quote-unquote higher quality DRAM modules and favored more what Samsung and the Koreans could supply. This horizontally integrated combo of Asian assembled hardware with American designed software was powerful and continued beyond the PC box to gadgets like the iPod, iPhone, and beyond. Japanese consumer tech products struggled to stay price competitive with this combo, hurting their profit margins. Returns on capital in the Japanese electronics industry fell to levels more like those of the chemicals or heavy industries. In such a scenario, vertical integration no longer made financial sense turning these expensive factories into painful liabilities. Remember I said that the Japanese chipmakers bought their equipment from family-affiliated manufacturers. The perspective by the Americans then was that the Japanese were keeping the quote-unquote best stuff for themselves, which was alarming. But over time, this too became an anchor. Equipment R&D costs steadily rose at about 13% a year during the late 1980s and early 1990s. With their core consumer electronics businesses no longer as profitable, 
and the export market blocked off, the Japanese could no longer afford to invest so much into equipment. Yet the Japanese semiconductor makers still kept their equipment relationships even as it became increasingly clear that that equipment was inferior to those offered by independent equipment suppliers like Tokyo Electron and Applied Materials, or EDA suppliers like Cadence, which later built a large business in Japan selling EDA tools that replace old in-house systems. Independent equipment and materials suppliers, even Japanese ones like Tokyo Electron and the photo mask maker JSR, turned outwards. They willingly sold to overseas semiconductor fabs like Samsung, Intel, and TSMC, arming the rebels, so to say. This dynamic explains how the Americans caught up the Japanese quality standard so quickly, and also why today many Japanese companies still dominate certain semiconductor segments like photo masks and chemicals, even after the Japanese semiconductor quote-unquote peak. Next, I also want to mention the fundamental technology. Japanese DRAM makers dominated almost every generation from 16 kilobit onwards, ramping up volume and first winner sales as a result. But these technology trends to achieve these gains began to taper. As I mentioned in an earlier video, the DRAM's greatest strength is its one transistor, one capacitor architecture with a capacitor holding a charge to represent a bit. But at the 4 megabit generation, the old planar capacitor had gotten to be so small that it could no longer hold the charge. So the industry had to build 3D capacitors, splitting on which type to go for. The Koreans went with easier but seemingly less sophisticated stack capacitors that went upwards. The Japanese, on the other hand, largely chose trench capacitors that drilled down into the silicon substrate. Samsung ended up beating the Japanese to market with their stack capacitors starting at the 16 megabit generation in the start of the 1990s. They then cemented that dominance at the 64 megabit generation, underpinned by Samsung beating the Japanese at what TSMC and others had already known what the latter was weak at, cycle time. Cycle time is essential in semiconductor fabrication. It directly links to how fast you can improve yields and with that cost. Samsung cut their cycle time from 90 days to 30 days while the Japanese were stuck at 60 days. And then at the low end, Micron took the profits they earned from being the last domestic DRAM supplier to fund upgrades like an expensive transition to 200mm wafers that cut their own costs at the trailing edge. The Japanese got caught in the middle and at the end of the 1990s went through a painful consolidation. I want to thank Tim Culpin for giving thoughts on this video and helping to get it out of a rut. Check out his substack, Tim Culpin's Position. So what happened for the Japanese semiconductor industry was that what had been their great strength turned out to be their downfall. Looking back at it, the Japanese semiconductor industry suffered a few obvious weaknesses. The high debt and the dependence on exports to fund it, the inability to buy from the best suppliers on the market, the lack of a good response to a formidable new challenger. To be honest, Japan's DRAM surge of the 1980s just looks like a bubble to me, one tied in to the country's larger ongoing economic bubble blowing up at the same time. The cycle time thing leads me to my last point, something that has stuck with me for a while. The Japanese memory makers took too long to decide anything. This was in contrast to Samsung and TSMC, which had fast-moving military-style organizations commanded by a single head at the top. The bubble inflated, the competition caught up, the equipment fell behind, and the business environment flipped. But the Japanese kept doing the same thing all through that. And that cost them. Alright everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the Patreon, and I'll see you guys next time.